what would be kind of those bullet point sort of symptoms of low testosterone? For me, I split it into three different categories. So the sexual, the physical, and then the psychological. How did you feel when you discovered that you had low testosterone? To be honest, I was relieved. A lot of the symptoms of low testosterone does overlap with depression. And so then a lot of people do get kind of labeled as being depressed. In general, men just suffer in silence. You have to do a bit of detective work basically to yeah, figure I was out. I say, you're like Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, a little like, bit, hey, a little bit. Hormonal <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. Within body fat, there is an enzyme called aromatase. This enzyme literally converts testosterone into estrogen. So if you've got excess body fat, that can then cause your testosterone level to fall. What is it about testosterone that we're just not willing to talk about as men? Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Men's Manual, a podcast designed to get men talking about many of the issues that they face and unfortunately suffer in silence with. I'm Sean Stafford, I'm a manual ambassador, and today I'm here to host the podcast and oversee the proceedings. This episode is called, Do I Have Low Testosterone? And it is a biggie. So digging into a few of the underlying statistics, I'm just gonna go to my notes to get these 100% right. It is thought that only 1% of men in the UK with low testosterone are on treatment, even though it is extremely effective, and that men's testosterone levels have dropped by 20% in the last 20 years. With the average testosterone levels in men, they're declining at a rate of 1% every year, give or take. So we're joined on the sofas today by a good friend of mine, Mr. Alistair Kennett. Wave to the camera, Ali. Hi, everyone. So Ali has an incredible story about testosterone and a journey which I'm sure will give a lot of people listening some really insightful nuggets to take away. Yeah, it's an absolute game changer. Excited to be here to talk about it a bit more. And not only do we have the man, the myth, the legend that is Ali Kennett on the sofa, we also have Dr. Manny, a testosterone specialist at Manual. Yeah. And you're going to be able to give us and lean into your expertise and knowledge from a more scientific background to really sort of debunk some of the myths and sort of misconceptions around testosterone and having low testosterone. Absolutely, yeah. Very happy to be here. So yeah, we'll be talking about kind of the more medical side of testosterone. So thanks for joining me, guys. And Ali, welcome to the Men's Manual. So I know you've got a lot to share about the symptoms <laughs> and the symptomology of low testosterone and your own personal journey. But firstly, mm -hmm. give us a little bit of an insight into the work that you currently do with Manual. So it all started about six or seven years ago um, when I had low testosterone. And I actually ended up starting a company with my brother. Um, and since then, basically joined Manual and now we are growing the category under Manual um, and building out the TRT service with them. Amazing. Dr. Manny, thank you so much for joining us as well. Please give me and all the guys listening a little bit of information about how you became to be a doctor, a doctor at Manual and why endocrinology specifically is such of interest to you. Yeah, so um, I started my training to be a doctor in 2010. Um, I fully qualified in 2016. After that, I've done my GP training. So I'm a fully qualified GP. I finished that a couple of years ago. Um, I've always had like a keen interest in endocrinology. Um, back when I was in medical school, I did a separate degree, which was specifically on endocrinology because I always found that kind of the most interesting part of medicine for me personally. So I wanted to get a bit more sort of experience in that area. Um, and then this job came along at Manual to do testosterone replacement and it kind of fit me perfectly. It kind of covers all the interests that I have, especially as a GP as well. I like to sort of have a broad knowledge of medicines and that testosterone basically can affect all parts of a man basically. So having that kind of experience of endocrinology and general practice is kind of what made me um, come into Manual and uh, be a TRT doctor here. So winding it back a little bit, um, for those listening that might know or might not know what endocrinology is, right. can you unpack that a little bit for me? 
Yeah, so endocrinology is basically the area of medicine that looks at hormones. Um, so again, like cardiology looks at the heart or uh, respiratory medicine looks at the lungs. Yeah. So endocrinology is specifically to do with the hormonal systems in the body. So the thyroid hormone, the other hormones like cortisol, um, adrenaline, all of those kind of covers endocrinology. So testosterone is a part of that. And what And what is it about endocrinology and sort of the hormones specifically that sparked your interest? I became really interested in it in medical school because basically the endocrine problems can just, they, they can be a bit complicated in that they're hard to pick up because they affect so many systems in the body. So, I mean, we'll obviously be talking about testosterone today, which can affect basically all parts, you know, psychologically, physically. Um, and then the other conditions that I was learning about, so relate to like the thyroid hormone, for example. Um, again, this presents in a very kind of vague way and it takes a bit of sort of unpacking to figure out that, oh, this is actually related to this specific hormone. That's what I found really interesting about it. And that's kind of what brought me into sort of wanting to learn more about endocrinology. It's kind of you have to unpick things and you have to do a bit of detective work basically to yeah, figure I was out. Say, you're like Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, a little like, bit. Hey, a little bit. Hormonal <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> basically, yeah. So that's why I really like loved it. And then that's why I've kind of come into this area. Amazing. So to give you guys a bit of background, the men's manual is a, a safe space where we look to unpack a lot of sort of common issues that many men are facing and give them not only some some background of your own experiences and a little bit of science to, to help them better understand the processes that are going on in the body, but it's also to help them optimize and live their healthiest lives possible. So my question to you, or my next question to you would be like, how do you guys manage your own health? And how do you try to stay healthy having such busy jobs working at Manual? I mean, I, I think it's these these are all things that everybody knows about right but the main things for me are firstly exercise like if i don't exercise a few times a week at least yeah. then i really notice it from a mental health point of view um but also energy i just feel like fatigued i start getting aches and pains like in my upper back if i'm working a lot that kind of thing um exercise sorts all of that out for me right. um and particularly mentally it just makes me feel a lot better and a lot clearer um the other big one has to be sleep. Like if I if I don't get seven to eight hours sleep a night, then I feel it the next day. And I definitely get more like anxiety or I can feel lower mood if I don't have that sleep. Um, I didn't take it so seriously when I was a bit younger, but now I'm taking a lot more seriously of the sleep. What other things do you do to make sure? That um, I, I mean, eat, eating, I don't notice as much of a difference, like, like eating well compared to not eating quite so well. Mm. But for me, it's like time of eating, how much I eat. Um, it's very easy for me to eat too much and my weight like creeps up. So I'm like trying to lose weight at the moment. Um, but I do feel better like not eating quite so much food and just in general. Um, and eating the right things. So I, th I think it does help. But uh, it's, it's definitely the sleep and exercise, which are the main things for me in terms of how I feel. Amazing. Manny, so obviously being a doctor, you must be working crazy hours. Yeah. Can. How do you manage to navigate your health journey and, and sort of take all the steps in order to kind of ensure your long-term health? It can be difficult for certain. Um, it's a lot of what Ali was kind of mentioning. So focusing on kind of adapt, uh, adopting healthy kind of general lifestyle. Um, so yeah, like sleeping well, I find that uh, similar to everything that you were saying, like sleep affects me a lot. So when I've gone days without enough sleep, like I just don't feel right. And then I, when I have a good sleep and then everything kind of feels a bit better. So sleeping is super important, I think. Um, healthy eating, um, exercising, all of these are really important when it comes to your general health and also your mental health. I think people kind of neglect the fact that physical uh, or doing exercise and things does have quite a big impact on your mental health. Um, so yeah, on those days where I've been working on call shifts or been doing a set of nights and yeah, you can, I mean, I don't eat well during those times and I don't sleep well during those times, mm -hmm. but then I try to make up for it afterwards or at least focus on that once a busier period is over. But absolutely, I think stress management is a big part of things as well. So making sure that you do take time to relax or 
do whatever you enjoy that, you know, sort of de-stresses you because stress can affect, I mean, we're obviously going to be talking about hormones today, but it can affect all your kind of hormones in the body. Um, so yeah, these are the kind of things that I tend to focus on as much as I can um, to stay healthy. I would add to this probably like reducing or limiting the amount of alcohol you drink. Mm. Um, I think it's okay occasionally, but again, I, occasionally I'll get into a habit of, you know, just one or two glasses of drink yeah. of alcohol a night and it affects your sleep, but it yeah. also gives you bad, it makes it so much easier to eat the wrong things as well. And they all tend to go together. I think mm. if I've got poor sleep or if I'm having poor sleep, I'll end up eating not so well and I'm more likely to drink. And then I'm more likely to drink. If I'm more likely to drink, I don't sleep as well. And yeah. then I'll eat worse and all the rest of it. So it kind of they all kind of go together for me. Yeah, you know, they, absolutely. They say it's bi-directional, don't they? So if you, if you have good sleep, the hormones released, yeah. you know, the leptin and ghrelin relationship. Yeah, yeah. If you have, if mm-hmm. you have more sleep, you're more likely to eat better. Yeah. And also if you have more sleep, you're more likely to exercise. Um, yeah. Yeah. At a, at a better intensity as well. But also if you eat better, you're more likely to sleep better. And if you train, you're more yeah. likely to sleep better as well. So that, that positive reinforcement, that bi-directional flow of, of good things, mm. it's kind of all underpinned by having a good night's sleep. Yeah. Kind of that it definitely becomes a really crucial part of the whole like being healthy, focusing on sleep and making sure that you kind of set yourself up as as well as you can. But yeah, alcohol definitely again the way that it affects sleep, it, it does give you poor quality sleep. So if you are drinking frequently, you're not getting a good night's sleep afterwards, and that does have a snowball effect on on the rest of of your week or your yeah generally how you're feeling. I think the other interesting thing about alcohol in particular is how it impacts the hormones. Mm. So. I notice this more and more actually. If I drink quite a bit, um, my estrogen levels go up. Yeah. Um, and how, do you, how, do, how does that manifest itself in you? Are you there crying in the shower? Or? <laughs> Almost at times, yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a regular does, thing for Ali. Yeah, but it, it does it does impact your mood definitely. Um, you'll notice more swelling in like your face. Mm-hmm. Um, it can affect things like just you know general energy levels. Um, it probably makes it more difficult to lose body weight as well or okay. body fat. Um, yeah, so it, it impacts quite a lot. Uh, it, it, you just don't feel right the next day, basically. So you're obviously pretty clued up and pretty in tune with your body. So I've got a, you know, I'm really interested to know, like, where did your journey start with low testosterone? And, you know, what has that journey looked like over the last six or seven years? Sure. So it did start about, about seven or eight years ago, maybe even nine years ago, actually, um, probably for a year or two, I was just noticing like a, a decline in my energy levels, um, poor sleep quality. I basically had insomnia. I had really, you know, I was, I was getting a little bit flabby. I'd always gone to the gym like religiously, six, six times a week, five times a week. I was doing a lot of Olympic weightlifting at the time. So I was extremely motivated to go to the gym um, and it got to the point where I just couldn't exercise. I was forcing myself to go to the gym and I would just be sat there. I just remember sitting there on the bench like, I can't do, I just can't do any more or any more sets. Like, and, I, and I just old, didn't feel like I had any energy. How old were you when this was happening? That was probably from about 25, um, 25, 26. And yeah. then when I was 27, that's when I found um, a TRT service and, and and started up with that. So one of my friends actually had had a test done and he said, to, and he'd been suffering from similar kind of symptoms. Uh, and he, he basically said to me, mm, you should try this out. Maybe, maybe you're suffering from something similar. So got the test done, showed that I had low free testosterone. Um, and then from there, I got a second, second test done and started up with a TRT service. Um, within about a few days, complete change. My energy levels were amazing. Yeah. Uh, I felt really positive, assertive at, at work. Um, like l- a lot less anxiety. I'd been suffering with a lot of anxiety at the time. My sleep was better. I was falling asleep after about five, 10 minutes of putting my head down. Whereas previously, even though I was knackered, it was taking me three or four hours to fall asleep. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I'd previously been yawning all day, basically completely knackered, unable to work brain fog, brain fog's really weird. It's like, you know, you can do mental arithmetic, 
but you just can't think of the numbers or you can't think of the right word to say. So it's really, it's really difficult because you, you basically feel like you're becoming more stupid. But you're <laughs> like, but there's no reason for it. Um, and then that just completely changed. And I felt great. Um, put on more muscle, lost body fat, mm. able to go to the gym regularly, recover really well. Um, and I was actually talking to my brother in the car and he, I, I mentioned to him that I just started, started with this TRT service. And he said to me, he's two years older than me. And he was like, I've been, I've been trying to find out what the problem was for myself for like three or four years. And he'd been to all these like business um, mentors and things like this. Um, to try and like work out why his motivation wasn't as good. Um, and he had all the same symptoms. He started a few weeks later because he also had low levels, um, completely changed his life as well. Wow. So from then we were both thinking, okay, this company that's doing, that's providing it for us, they're doing it quite well, but we think we can do it better um, with some decent technology to improve like the service, that kind of thing. So that's what we did. And then, and then we started up um, our company and then the rest is history, really. Amazing. It's kind of grown from there. Amazing. Mm. Dr. Manny, so you must have be sort of listening to Ali's story yeah. and kind of, uh, there must have been a lot of alarm bells going off. So if people are listening back home, what would be kind of those bullet point sort of symptoms of low testosterone that people should be looking out for? Right. So for me, I split it into three different categories. So the sexual, the physical, and then the psychological. So in terms of like the sexual side of things, so it'd be things like a low sex drive, low libido. Uh, so that reduced interest in sex compared to previously. Um, also erectile dysfunction. So having difficulty getting or maintaining erections. And then another um, sort of sign that's quite uh, linked with low testosterone is uh, sort of a reduction in your morning erections so the ones that you wake up with spontaneously if you're noticing that that's going down that's also a possible sign of low testosterone then moving on to the kind of psychological side as ali mentioned so it's things like brain fog um forgetfulness issues with memory issues with mood so you could be low mood for no kind of clear explanation or anxiety or irritability so you know becoming more grumpy or more easily annoyed by people um then it can be low energy is another one of the really sort of main symptoms of low testosterone so just feeling very fatigued very tired falling asleep in the afternoon or finding it hard to you know work or function as you usually would um and then the physical side of things um again as ali touched on so finding it hard to put on muscle mass or losing muscle, um, putting on fat really easily, especially around the tummy. So like central fat, mm. um, and then finding it hard to shift that as well. Um, some people sometimes find that their like facial hair growth has slowed down or body hair growth, things like that. So these are the kind of ways that I split it up. So it's the physical, psychological and the sexual side of things. So again, as we were talking about earlier, testosterone can affect basically many different parts of a man. So those are the kind of main things that we kind of look out for um, in terms of low testosterone. That is quite a hit list of symptomology yeah. of, of <laughs> symptomology and symptoms, right? That 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 can be devastating, absolutely, to, yeah. to a man. So, Ali, like, what what was the most difficult part of you sort of experiencing this low level testosterone? It's hard to say what exactly was the most difficult part, but I think um, it was mainly the fatigue and the kind of anxiety and the uh, the mental effects i think you know if you're if you're used to being able to think quite clearly mm. and then you can't you know you just can't communicate with people um and you can't focus on on anything it's very it's very difficult to to work to function um and things like relationships suffer a lot because like you're saying being irritable mm. being grumpy it's like that classic kind of older grumpy yeah. old man yeah. kind of feel right yeah. and i think everyone's pro probably knows like uh maybe their dad maybe their uncle maybe their granddad mm. and they have kind of experienced that the that kind of male figure who always seems to be a bit irritable everything you know they're grumpy about everything that's what i was like and i was i remember thinking I'm turning into my dad. This is, I'm literally, I'm 27. I'm turning into my dad. Yeah. Because my, my dad 
the whole time that we knew him, he was exactly like that, grumpy, irritable. So we actually got him tested and it turned out that he also had low levels. So this was very this, similar levels to what me and my brother had. That was going to be even my at next 27. question. It yeah. was, you know, you, you obviously suffered with low testosterone levels. Your brother suffered with low mm -hmm. testosterone levels and your dad, his character in, you know, in your head was, you know, displaying all the symptoms of it. Is, is it something that is hereditary? Well, it's interesting because I, I've done a really interesting um, genetic test. And one of the things it actually looks at is whether you're more susceptible to having low testosterone. Yeah. And yes, it said that I was more susceptible to it based on my genetics. So um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly which gene it is or, you yeah. know, or, or how that works, but the, there seems to be some kind of genetic element to it. And, you know, you'd expect that because firstly, I guess men have different, different kind of levels of testosterone yeah. and that probably is genetic, right? But this was more like my levels always felt pretty good. And then around that age, they just plummeted. Um, and that's when I was, you know, very early on, I started noticing a massive change. How, how did it feel when you kind of finally opened up about having low testosterone? Um, I, th I was quite open about it, I think. That's generally just what I'm like. Some guys mm. won't tell anybody um, that, they, that they're suffering from this or that they've managed to get treatment. So um for me it was quite natural to talk to my friends about it and my family about it and you know it i think it's really important to do that because you don't always know that people are suffering from well from from low testosterone but from anything really yeah. from like mental health issues or mm -hmm. whatever so for me it's quite important to talk about it and to raise awareness as well which is a big part of um you know what we're trying to do with manual how did you feel when you discovered that you had low testosterone um to be honest i was relieved yeah completely relieved i was like this is the reason why i'm feeling like this it's not something that i'm gonna have for the rest of my life that was a massive relief because i was i was like i can't you know i would not want to live like this for the rest of my life it's you know just knackered the whole time you don't feel like you're you're you know producing good work you don't feel like you're productive you basically feel lazy demotivated you don't have the energy to do anything um you probably just end up eating you know the, this like when you're tired right you just eat yeah. stuff that you shouldn't be eating so i didn't want to live like that and it was a really big relief for me personally would um was it quite depressive like was it was it having all those symptoms that it did it weigh down on you was it quite a de depressive sort of cloud hanging over it, your head it was and actually manny's manny basically explained it so well which was the, I, I had, I felt like I had depression, but there felt like there was no reason really for it. Mm, yeah. You know, it's not like my mum had just died. Mm. Um, and I know that's basically, you know, depression doesn't normally have a reason, I don't think, or often it doesn't, right? But this is what it felt like. It didn't, it wasn't like I had a particular reason, like I had a decent job, um, had a good family, you know, I had no reason to be in low mood, but I was. Um, so it's really interesting and that that's to, that's to me why I felt like there was something off you know yeah we I we see that a lot in general practice as well because people do present with uh, I mean a lot of the symptoms of low testosterone does overlap with depression and so mm. then a lot of people do get kind of labeled as being depressed or just having generalized anxiety and then they get put on antidepressants or SSRIs those kind of medications for that but it doesn't work uh, I think that's a time to maybe think that maybe that's not the diagnosis or possibly there's something else going on. But again, there is a sort of lack of knowledge about testosterone generally when it comes to like doctors or the medical community, something that's kind of been underutilized or underlooked into for many, many years. So now it's only starting to gain more kind of attention that it kind of deserves. But um, absolutely, we we get lots of patients who are relieved as well when they find like this is actually what's going on because they've been treated with various things and nothing's worked and they just think, is this how I am? But then we actually can say, yes, it is testosterone. And then going on to treatment can then help that. Um, so yeah, it's kind of exactly as you explain. Um, a lot of people do feel relieved when they kind of find that diagnosis. So from going back to more of a, a layman's and just really mapping out the journey that you went on. So if somebody returns a, a blood test with low testosterone, what sort of 
options are available to them in, in forms of like different forms of treatment? Yeah, so there, there are quite a few different options, actually. Um, unfortunately, because of advertising rules, we can't go into them on the podcast. Right. Um, but if you want to head to the manual website, anyone watching this, um, you can find out a bit more about all the different options that we offer. Okay, and what is the manual website? So if you go to manual.co and then you just click on the low testosterone um, picture on the homepage, yeah. then you can just go straight through to that and you can learn more about the different options. Amazing. So what <clears throat> would your advice be to anybody that kind of suspects they have low testosterone? So I think, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear to me now, like get, get a blood test done. Um, it's really easy to do. We can do blood tests, which you do at home. Um, you don't have to go into a doctor surgery. Mm. You don't have to talk to your GP if you don't want to. Um, we know that there's a lot of stigma around this and that some GPs, unfortunately, aren't happy to treat it or even talk about it. So, you know, having a blood test at home, very easy, gives you a very accurate result um, and you get your results within a few days. So that's the best way of doing it. You know, when I had when I was first suffering from it, I just didn't even know that this existed particularly not in the UK, um, as a treatment. I had no idea that these symptoms were associated with low testosterone. So um, it was more difficult back then. Now I think there's no excuse for, for not getting tested if you need to. I find it really fascinating that, particularly with the, the topic of testosterone, that there is some level of stigma attached to it. And why do you think that men aren't super open and up for having that discussion when we look at what I had to your brother and if he'd had that discussion a couple of years earlier his quality of life would have improved and he would have got those extra years back like what is it that about testosterone that we're just not willing to talk about as men I think there's a couple of things I think in general men just suffer in silence um, and this is probably like a you know everyone, everyone kind of knows this now but it it's still an issue and I don't know if it's a uh, like a social thing or if it's you know, is it built into men or is it something that we learn? But, um, you know, I think everybody knows that most guys just kind of go, oh, I'm not going to go to the doctor. I'm not going to get that checked. It'll be fine. You know, stiff up a lip. Keep, keep going. Yeah, underlying Miss Kisbo, this macho yeah. um, sort of, I, I'll, yeah. I'll be fine. It'll be okay. Yeah. But, you know, how many men out there are suffering in silence when there's a real easy fix to what, seems like some really devastating symptoms yeah well, there's, there's probably loads and that's why doing things like this and sort of getting like ali's story and uh spreading that word on testosterone i think will help with sort of getting this message out yeah i mean uh, one of the stats that you shared at the start was we think that about only about one percent of men who have low testosterone get treated at the moment or are being treated for it um another stat is one in four men over the age of 30 we think has low, have low testosterone. Wow. Um, that's huge, right? That's yeah. an absolutely huge number of men in the UK. So, uh, and that's only going to increase as things like, our, you know, our lifestyles get worse and people get become more overweight, things like that. So it, it's a huge number of men who have this condition, who are suffering with all of the symptoms. No idea. And most of them don't have any idea what's causing it. And if they go to their GP, a lot of the time... Like, like you touched on, Manny, you won't get tested um, because, you know, they, they, they don't know what to look for. And it's much easier to often provide, you know, like mental health services or SSRIs, like antidepressants. Yeah. When actually a lot of the time it's is a hormonal issue. Yeah. So is there a reason why, whether GPs or doctors are slightly resistant? Yeah. So basically when it comes to GPs, they just don't have enough sort of experience or teaching or training when it comes to testosterone. So um, it's not naturally something that they would necessarily think of when presented with these kind of symptoms. Again, a lot of these symptoms are quite vague or, or they could be caused by many different things. It's more putting them all together. Um, and there isn't a specific guideline when it comes to the NHS or like the NICE guidelines, um, which is what GPs go by. So there isn't one for testosterone replacement therapy services. So um, when it comes to that, that's why I think a lot of GPs don't necessarily know to test about it. it. They're not sort of resistant or they 
when when sort of broached by a patient, oftentimes they will test testosterone. But again, when it comes to treating it, they don't have the the knowledge or there isn't a guideline specifically for them to go by. Um, so then you have to look at other guidelines. For example, the British British Society of Sexual Medicine have a guideline um, which gives information on on testosterone replacement. So um, I think that's part of the reason of why GPs don't necessarily think to test it in many cases. And do you, do you think that will change? Because obviously, you know, from a, and it, I would say it's related, but it's unrelated. But if you wind back the clock a decade, maybe two decades, and you take the fairer sex women as an example and their struggles with the menopause, and you look at all the really, really good work that has been done and the awareness and now, you know, getting treated for the menopause is is really, really straightforward. Yeah. Do you mm-hmm. think that men will go through the same uh, and the menopause, we'll call it, will go through the same process and will be much more educated and, and this sort of therapy and treatment will be much more available? Absolutely. I think it will head that way. Again, as you mentioned with HRT, which treats um, sort of the symptoms of the menopause, there was a lot of stigma and a lot of misinformation about that. And it did put women off going to see their GP about HRT and and sadly a lot of women suffered for many years when they didn't need to and it's only been more recently where there's been more sort of uh, reporting on it more sort of um, exploring HRT as a as a treatment for the menopause that people are now much more open to going to the GP and GPs are more comfortable prescribing it so that's been a really positive change that's been in the last couple of years Um, obviously with uh, testosterone replacement is probably lagging behind a bit. Um, so I think that within the next couple of years, uh, with the more sort of exposure it gets and with people being more aware of it, that it will hopefully kind of catch up to what HRT is for women. Which is yeah. why we're doing this podcast. <clears throat> exactly. <laughs> I think that there is a, and not to be too controversial, but um, unfortunately I, I see a lot of men or have seen a lot of men over the years um, who obviously come to our service and they've been to their GPs or even to endocrinologists yeah. and they are basically told, even though they've got very low levels, um, well within the guidelines, they're basically told, no, you're fine. You can grow a beard, you know, things like this, or basically doctors saying, no, you don't want to start that. That would give you prostate cancer. Um, so I, I, I think that beyond there being like no, not enough guidelines, I, I actually think that, you know, there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of stigma still related to it. A lot of men um, that I've spoken to go to their GP and they basically get told, no, you just want it to put on muscle. Um, like, I'm not going to give it to you. So th- th- there's, a, there's a lot still that we need to break down and a lot of awareness. You know, the prostate cancer thing, complete myth based on the evidence we know. Um, similar with the cardiovascular uh, risks like the, the the big studies that have been released recently they basically um, show that men who are on uh, on a test with a testosterone replacement therapy service they have a lower risk of cardiovascular diseases than men who have low testosterone and and don't go on treatment so if it's if it's done well and it's monitored well then it can be very safe and there, there's still a lot of myths it, and it's exactly the same thing that HRT suffered from. Mm. There are a couple of studies which indicated um, an increased risk of things like breast cancer. And that meant that most of the GPs in the UK, or a lot of the GPs, a lot of doctors in the UK, essentially wouldn't treat women for it at all. Um, so it's, it's kind of breaking down that, making sure that there's really good research as well, so that we know exactly what the risks are and also how to mitigate them. I think that's the really important like next step for TRT and TRT services now. Yeah, I think the the advice can only be as good as the science, right? And if the science is still fairly new and the amount and the depth and amount of research that's been carried out on the subject isn't quite there yet and it's constantly evolving, then, you know, asking GPs to stay on top of the cutting edge innovative science in this quite yeah. niche sector is is always going to be a challenge. But I think that is where company like manual can really bridge the gap in Mm -hmm. providing good quality um information and guidance so i think whereas you know with every obstacle there's an opportunity right and i think that's something where hosting a podcast like this having these conversations in a in an open safe space 
hopefully will steer the men that are potentially being overlooked currently to be able to go and do some research and, and find some credible information and hopefully find some solutions which can really impact their lives in a positive way. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, as you said, you, c- you can't expect GPs to know all of this stuff. They can't know everything. Um, and it is very niche. Uh, and the, there's, there's a lot of um, reading required to, to kind of get to a really good level of knowledge where you, you can safely treat people. Um, and also, I mean, GPs get like 10 minutes per consultation. It's yeah, insane. Yeah. Uh, I used to be a physio and we would have faster appointments, which were 20 minutes. And that was tough. So 10 yeah. minute appointments is is just crazy. Yeah, um, it can be really hard for a GP to explore, as we mentioned, like all the symptoms of low testosterone. Sometimes they only get to discuss one or two and it can seem like it maybe is something else like depression or anxiety. So that can be really challenging for them. But again, a company like Manual, where we specialize in testosterone replacement therapy services, we have that knowledge and, and we have that kind of experience and we have that patient base where we've treated many, many people and we've seen uh, the response. So that's sort of um, one of the ways that you can sort of access this treatment. So going a little bit more granular and me trying to geek out a little bit because I love numbers. So if somebody is having a blood test and those test results come back as them having low levels of testosterone, what from, from a numbers point of view, what would those numbers look like on the on the blood test? So looking at the total testosterone value, we at Manual will say if you've got two levels that are below 15, then you are then eligible. And 15 is 15? Yeah, nanomoles per litre. So yeah, it's around that level of 15 or lower where men can start experiencing symptoms of low testosterone. So that's why that's sort of a cutoff that we have. We obviously take into account your symptoms and the sort of whole picture. And then we also look at free testosterone as well. So in the body, testosterone or when we do tests, we measure both free and total testosterone. So total testosterone is basically a measure of all the testosterone in your blood um, because testosterone can either travel as free testosterone, so it's not bound to anything. And it's actually the free testosterone that exerts effects in the body. So it's right. kind of the more important value when it comes to looking at testosterone results. Or testosterone can then um, travel in the blood bound to proteins. Some of the common ones are albumin or sex hormone binding globulin or shpg Um, so when you look at total testosterone it's taking into account free and the testosterone bound to those proteins um, whereas free testosterone looks specifically at testosterone not bound to any proteins and so the free testosterone level is 0.225 so if you've got a level two levels below 0.225 that would also make you eligible amazing I think the um, the free testosterone is really important because a lot of blood tests don't test for that. And particularly in older men, we know that as you get older, past the age of 30, you start getting more of this SHBG, the sex hormone binding globulin. Um, and as you produce more of that, your free testosterone level will drop, whereas yeah. your total testosterone might actually look quite good. Yeah. And in some cases, even you get this kind of compensated pattern where you... Um, your body produces more testosterone to try and compensate for the fact that you've got a raised uh, SHBG. So if you were to just go to your GP and they just did a total testosterone, um, you'd look fine. Yeah. Your testosterone is normal. Okay, oh, you've got a great testosterone. It's like 19, 20. If you look a little bit further, you look at SHBG and albumin, yeah. maybe your free testosterone is a lot lower and yeah. that's what's causing your symptoms. And that's why going a little bit deeper and maybe speaking to a specialist or getting a specialist blood test is absolutely worth it. Yeah, definitely. Mm. So you get your blood test results back. They say that they show the sort of numbers that we've been talking about. Is there a natural way to manage and boost low testosterone or is medication the only answer? So there are ways that you can kind of optimize your testosterone production. We kind of touched upon a few of them earlier when we just talked about general healthy lifestyle. Yeah. Um, so ensuring that you sleep well. So really focusing on sleep. We know that testosterone does get released during this during sleep. So going through proper sleep cycles can help boost your own testosterone production. Similarly, if you haven't been sleeping well for a week or so, your testosterone level probably would be lower at the end of that week. So ensuring that you sleep well, um, eat well, um, 
reducing alcohol. We know that uh, sort of drinking too much alcohol can sort of boost the amount of estrogen in the body, yeah. which can then sort of counteract testosterone and then also bring your testosterone le levels lower. Um, and then similar to that is body fat, because basically within body fat, there is an enzyme called aromatase. This enzyme literally converts testosterone into estrogen. So if you've got excess body fat or if you are obese or um, you, basically if you've got more of that enzyme um, through body fat, that can then cause your testosterone level to fall. Um, so uh, reducing stress as well. Um, stress we know can interfere with hormones. It can interfere with testosterone too. So it's kind of those general things of leading a healthy lifestyle as much as possible can help sort of optimize your testosterone production um it won't necessarily treat that level if you do yeah. have low testosterone and it's in those cases where then looking into testosterone replacement therapy services becomes appropriate um but doing those steps would definitely be the first steps in time in terms of trying to manage testosterone and and boost your own levels um and then if that's not enough or if it's not sort of getting your testosterone to where it should be or where you don't have symptoms of low testosterone then it would be looking into services to to do that instead so yeah. what so what is a a, a trt service and so what I, can you I, expect by engaging with one yeah so a good trt service should um have a, a number of different treatments um obviously we can't go into the exact types of treatment um like medical treatments on the podcast but but if you want to know more, go to the manual website. You can go to the website <laughs> at manual.co. Um, but alongside that, as, as Manny was just saying, a really big part of it is that kind of lifestyle management, weight loss management. You know, if, if somebody comes to us and they, they're, they're very overweight, then one of the first things that we will consider, or the doctors will consider, is should we try and help this individual lose weight first? Because it might be that actually they've got a very high estrogen, they've got low testosterone, and what the estrogen does is it suppresses your testosterone production. So overweight means that you're converting more testosterone into estrogen, and then the estrogen suppresses your testosterone production, and it's kind of like a, a vicious circle. Yeah. So if you if you get them to lose weight, sometimes through medically managed weight loss, um, but sometimes just through lifestyle changes, diet, all the rest of it, then that in itself can increase someone's testosterone level. You can you can increase increase it by like five or six nanomoles per liter just through that. Um, you know, an, another thing that a lot of people talk about are, are things like testosterone boosters. Um, they're quite in vogue at the moment. You know, lots of people selling lots, lots of different ones, mm. ashwagandha and all these other things. I mean, the evidence around those is is pretty poor in general. Um, the, sometimes the you know the results can be temporary. They can impact your actual production longer term. So they're, they're not really recommended um, by by any of our doctors or anyone that I know. Um, but really the lifestyle factors are the things that you can, you can make a big difference from those first. And sometimes it's a case of combining um, some of the treatments with that weight loss in certain patients as well. And we have extremely good results with that. And it actually helps men to keep their, their weight off uh, longer term. Okay, amazing. So how long do you have to be on a TRT service for? So usually people start to see improvements quite quickly. So on average, it's a couple of weeks where people would notice uh, changes or improvements in their symptoms. And is it expensive? Uh, no, it's not too expensive. So it start from around £60 a month for the subscription which includes things like medication and support and advice um, and, and other, other support as needed. Um, and it, depending on the other medications or other treatments that you have alongside that, um, it can go up to about £145 per month, £150 per month. So hopefully there's, there's different options that are affordable for different people. So as this podcast is called The Men's Manual, we thought it would be a really good idea to have an actual physical copy of a men's manual that each expert and guest will get to add their own piece of information and their own little nugget of wisdom. So this will hopefully become a guide to live by and whatever advice and sort of nugget of wisdom you put in here doesn't have to be testosterone related. So Ali, I'm passing you, Thank you. the manual. 
And what would your addition be? Well, it has to be testosterone related for me, I think. Um, for me, I would say it's important to get tested. Even if you don't have symptoms at the moment, it's useful because you can then find out later on in life, if you do start to get symptoms, you can compare and kind of see how you measure up um, and how your testosterone levels have changed over time. So even, you know, even if it's not your testosterone levels, just a general blood test, I think it's really important to, to get your blood test checked. So that would be my bit of advice. So it'd be essentially be more proactive <laughs> in looking after and being aware of your own health. Yeah, I, I think it's so easy nowadays to get a blood test done. Um, there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't get one done either through your GP um, and use the NHS or through a company like Manual. Um, and, you know, you, you can identify lots of issues before they or before they start becoming issues. Um, so, yeah, I think getting getting tested, getting checked out is really important. Amazing. And Ali, pass that lovely green <laughs> book over to Dr. Manny. Thank you. Manny, you've, this better be good. You've had a couple of minutes while Ali was waffling on. Absolutely. To, to <laughs> make sure that the nugget you're going to put in there is, is epic. Come on. Well, my like little nugget of information or advice would be for men to be more open to talking about sort of the symptoms that they are experiencing. You touched on it right at the start of your story with your brother as well. So just not sort of holding it in and just expecting things to get better on its own to be sort of more open with talking with friends, family. That was kind of how you found out about um, low testosterone in the first place was from your friends. So I think that's a really important message from the discussion we've had today is for men to just be a bit more open and and either talk to friends family your gp um about any kind of things that you're experiencing and then hopefully there are things that can be done and and ways that sort of your life can improve if you're more open and talk to people about it i think Absolutely. both of those sort of entries into our men's manual will definitely make this more of a, a guide to live your life by so thank you so much so that is it for another amazing episode of the men's manual podcast i want to say a massive thank you to my good friend ali kennett for sharing your experiences and your journey and just being really open and honest about your experiences with low testosterone i think that many men out there will take a lot from that so i really really appreciate that and a massive thank you to dr manny for coming in and sprinkling that little bit of scientific uh, expertise and really cutting through some of the noise in what is quite a controversial topic um, with testosterone and low testosterone we're going to be spending a bit more time together on the sofa for the bonus episode of the men's manual which is the men's manual xy so for all you guys listening right now look out for that it will be coming your way very soon if you have enjoyed this episode of the podcast please comment and leave a review for us it helps more people find us and helps more people get involved in this community and be part of what we're trying to do here at the men's manual podcast I'm Sean Stafford. I've been your host today. It's been an absolute pleasure and I can't wait to see you again next time.